Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Wait. Ten. Ten commandments. God has set before you this day his laws of life. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, it's great to see you this morning. How's everybody? We're good? Hey, uh, let's give a big thanks. Shout out to the crew up here for helping point us to Jesus uh, throughout the morning. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we're so grateful. And uh, hey, I understand we got a lot of guests here today. We're so glad you're here today. We are so hyped. We find ourselves in the midst of this series that we've been looking at throughout the summer uh, on the Ten Commandments. I'm curious, how many of you, uh, like me, when you were a kid, you learned how to play um, the game Clue? Anybody ever played Clue? Um, so you can see there, uh, you got the little characters. Uh, who was it? Miss Scarlet's one of them? Mr. Green? Always like Colonel Mustard. That was always a strange name. Um, and you've got, yeah, the different ones who are, um, you know, you're trying to figure out who done it, right? You got Miss White. She's over there. Surely she didn't do it, but maybe. And uh, then, then, you know, what, what the whole deal, though, is to try to figure out with, on the game, on the board, you try to figure out a few things, right? Who, who, who did it? Who, who killed somebody? Who murdered someone, right? Um, how did they do it? What did they do it with? What was the weapon of choice? I always thought the candlestick was kind of weird. And how about a rope? How psyched up is that? How crazy is that? Um, and then you, you figured out where they did it. Like it was, it was Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the billiard room, you know, or something like that. And if you could figure it all out, then you'd win the game. Now, not until later, or even this week, was I thinking, you know, the family gathers around this board. Think about this. And we all enter into this murder investigation. And you're like, yeah, now I'm like six, you know? And this is like normal. Like, like we're just we're all figuring out who killed someone with the can and as a kid you're like with a candlestick like how did that would they burn them and mom explains no you could actually hit someone so hard it would kill them <laughs> oh yeah right okay like this is normal and we play this game and it's like this this makes sense this is normal do you ever feel like in our culture that uh we in so many ways cheapen uh, you know, the, 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 human, uh, the human life. And, and today I'm going to do a little investigation of sorts. We're going to allow the Spirit to investigate our own hearts. But we're going to ask the question, man, how do we devalue human life every single day? There's so much tension in our world when you think about uh, the cheapening of human life. There, there's a lot of questions around how we treat children or, or immigrants or children of immigrants or oppression, uh, abuse of women. You think about sexual assault, you think about racism, abortion. I mean, there's so many uh, issues that come when we think about the sanctity of life and valuing human life. We're gonna get to a very, um, gosh, very personal matter for each one of us because this is one of those commands if you're like me um, I entered into it the past couple of weeks I'm like well never murder anybody I don't think we have any murderers in our church um, and so don't murder all right let's go to lunch you know because a lot of us are sitting here thinking I'm, I've never murdered I'm not gonna murder somebody uh, until <laughs> we start looking a little further a little deeper into this and so you know last week we looked at how we, really the hinge point of the commands where the first ones are around worshiping God and who he is. And then we have honor your father and your mother. And we noted that that one command could turn the course of our nation, bring revival into our nation, the singular command. And so then from that one follows now what many would call kind of the horizontal relationships that we have, right? When we're gonna see this, we're not to abuse human life physically, uh, sexually. By the way, next week we're going to talk about don't commit adultery, but we're going to look at, in general, sexual purity. All right. So we have um, 
Noel Boucher, who's going to be with us. I just want you to be here. Don't miss this. Noel's going to be here. Uh, he's with a ministry called Pure Hope, and he is going to come and talk about how we can live pure lives uh, in this over-sexualized culture that we live in. Uh, we've got options for uh, all the way up to sixth grade during this time. So K through four, just want to say, we'll meet uh, in third floor plights. We're gonna, we'll guide you a little bit next week. Uh, parents, drop off kids. Watch for in, uh, communications coming from our kids' ministry, from Jay and the crew. So K through second graders. And then fifth and sixth, we'll meet in the loft in the third floor. Frankly, if my kids were in fifth and sixth grade, I'd have them in here. That's me. But we're going to leave that to you as parents. And then afterwards, parents, every parent in here, uh, we want you to know that at 1.30, so go grab a bite to eat and then come up to the loft, which is just upstairs from here. And uh, Noel is going to be there uh, offering wisdom and instruction guidance on how to parent our children in this, again, over-sexualized you know, era and, and uh, culture that we live in. So it is going to be gold. And if you're a parent, I hope that you'll be here. Okay, We have options for your kids during that time as well. All right. So I wonder, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that you've heard a sermon on murder, but that's what we're going to talk about today. So like Clue, we're going to do a little investigation. Um, and I'm going to break down this sermon. We're gonna, so so let's, let's investigate. All right. So here's how this plays out. Like the game Clue, we're going we're gonna to think about, so who did it? Okay. Who did it? Who is the suspect? Who's the guilty one? How? What was the weapon of choice? And then where? Where did this happen? Uh, where did the murder take place? And we're going to do this by looking at three murders in the Bible, essentially. All right. The first one we're going to see is in Genesis 4. If you want to turn there, I'm just going to tell this story quickly. But um, it's Cain with violence in a field. Now, most of us know the story of Cain and Abel. Think about this. We're, they are the sons of Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve, after the fall, are cast out of the garden and they have two sons. We are four people into the creation narrative. The third one we're introduced to kills the fourth one. We're four chapters into the Bible. And we have a murder. So Abel is, um, he, he's, uh, he's a shepherd. Cain, his brother, is, is, a, is a farmer. Uh, Abel, his, his, uh, his offering to the Lord, his sacrifice to God is accepted because of his heart. Not because of the offering itself. Cain's is not. And so Cain deceives Abel. He lures him out into the wilderness where nobody's around but God, and he kills him. And, and, and then what we see in Genesis 6, it gets worse. It doesn't stop there. Look at Genesis 6, 11 on the screen. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. So much so, look at this. The inclination of the human heart is to only do violence. So God decides he's going to wipe out all humans but Noah and his family. We're six chapters into the story. And then after the flood, God explicitly says in Genesis 9, 5 and 6, you can see it there. Genesis 9, 5 and 6. And for your lifeblood, I'll require reckoning. From every beast, I will require it from man and from man. From his fellow man, I will require reckoning for the life of man. Whoever, watch this, sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. All right, so this is critical for us. The first step here, and again, just kind of buzz through the, the Cain and Abel story to make this point. An attack on another person is an attack on God himself. Why? Because every person is created in the image of God. And so every person is precious in the heart and in the eyes of God. It's kind of like me if, if you were to come after one of my children, right? I mean, if you came after one of my children to kill them or, or my wife, your mild-mannered, grace-giving pastor would become a raging, crazy man, okay? Uh, and that's true for every parent in here. Just think about God. Who, who loves us, who loves all people, not just us, not just his chosen ones, but he loves everybody because every person was created in his image. And this helps us to understand the, the sixth commandment so much more. And, and this is just foundational to where I want to go. So far, all these commands have been pretty unique uh, to Israel. But you can imagine a prohibition against murder is pretty much found in every culture, right? It's probably good not to murder. You know, we've already noted that for every negative command, God gives two positive reasons, to, pro to protect and provide. 
So in every culture, most people understand this, that there should be laws against murdering others. But this is a very complex thing. Other nations would actually say that you could uh, pay the price of a death of someone by offering your child to them. And instead, the Bible, when we look at the, 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 the Old Testament law, in Deuteronomy 24, 16, it forbade punishing children for the father's sins. And then, and then other nations would actually say you could determine the price. If you killed somebody, the, the, the family where you murdered one of their uh, family members, they could determine the price you have to pay. And again, in Numbers 35, 31, it forbade monetary uh, kind of payment for murder. So this points out that unique to Israel, the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh himself, he shows that murder is something different to God. Because in every case, defacing the image of God in a person is met with the same kind of punishment. Death would, would bring about death. You exchange one life for another because this is, is what, what, what Walter Kaiser Jr., he's an Old Testament scholar, he said it this way, the act of murder is tantamount to killing God in effigy, in his image, his, his uh, uh, representation or image of God. It's why the consequences of murdering someone was death for the murderer. And this was unique, actually, in Israel. We, we, we don't have time to get into all the complex issues. I mean, we could talk about uh, abortion. We could talk about euthanasia. We could talk about suicide, uh, accidental death, death penalty. I've studied all this stuff, you know, this week in regard to this command. But he brings down my point, a very complex kind of a command to four words. Thou shalt not murder. Don't murder. And this has incredible implications for us. Every one of these things that I've mentioned, we ought to look at God's word first. Let his word instruct us, not our own opinion or thought or wish it was like this or that. Partisan politics, whatever else. We, we don't look at popular opinion. We look at God's word to see what he says. So let's get a little closer to home. All right. Because here's where this is heading. What about sending men into an arena cheerfully, you know, lustfully crying out, cheering for a knockout? Is that honoring the image of God? Is that valuing life? Shouldn't there be a Christian ethic regarding sports? I, I was speaking at a, an event at a university not too long ago, and the whole thing was about a Christian perspective on sports. We looked at injuries and concussions and lifelong impact of sports injuries. Shouldn't it be that, that this command would, would somehow guide us to value or the sense of valuing life at every level of life? How does that come into play? What about watching horrifically violent films? Is that valuing life? Or, uh-oh, what about playing video games? Where the whole deal is that you are the shooter and you are killing other people for fun. I mean, we've taken Clue to a whole new level in our day. Does that devalue uh, human life. How does this command truly impact our lives? Okay, so I'm getting you to think about real life. Now, this command, more than the others, probably makes us think again, thanks, Jeff, thanks for the info, interesting. Uh, I'm not going to murder anyone, and I can certainly be a little more careful about what I watch, what movies I go to, what I see on TV. I'm good. Not so fast, because we have another murder to look at. And in this one, there's a twist. You can go ahead, in fact, turn to Matthew 5. We're going to actually look at this. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. Because here we have Jesus. Y'all think about this. We have Christ offering commentary on the command that he himself gave us. God himself brings commentary to this command. And by the way, can I say it? Uh, Jesus brings commentary to the entire Bible. That is a pretty good uh, hermeneutic. That's a good exegetical way to approach Scripture. Jesus is perfect theology. How about that? With everybody's you know, opinion and dogma and your take on this or that theological thing or whatever else, Jesus is perfect theology. And we see it lived out in his life. But man, what we're going to see here is... Jesus is going to take this to a new level because this murder here has a twist. It's like CSI. Anybody watch CSI? There's like 14 of them now, right? Um, I'm looking for CSI University Park, you know, or something. You know, you know CSI Richardson. 
um, CSI walks a hatchy. I mean, that would be amazing. <laughs> But uh, it probably is one out there, CSI, you know, Lake Highlands. And, and there's, there's one for everything, but like every one of those shows, it boils down to a few components. If you've ever watched it. Anybody ever watch CSI? Anybody? Some of you? So if you watch this, it, 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 bears it, you know, it brings it down to, to kind of the, the key elements for solving a murder. And, and, and so it's basically, you know, you have suspects, you have a weapon, so cause of death, and then you have an opportunity, the motive. The twist in the show though, is when the detective reveals an unexpected kind of element within. It could be an unexpected person. You know, uh, like, wait, what was that executive doing over on that side of town? You know, or it could be an unexpected weapon. Like, well, he was, I pushed him and he hit his head on the table and killed him. Or an unexpected place or, or, or you know, like, wow, again, what, what's going on over there? Or someone that you didn't expect, some friend close by or maybe a distant character. And this, this right here, what Jesus brings to us in Matthew 5, it, it, it has all three at play. I want you to see there's an unexpected suspect, there's an unexpected weapon, and there's an unexpected place. So check this out. Let's read this together. It's in chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old. Now, anytime Jesus, uh, here we are in the Beatitudes or the, the Sermon on the Mount. Whenever he says, okay, you heard it said, but... I mean, this is, this is big. And he's in front of these Pharisees saying, let me, let, me, let me offer commentary. Let me bring the truth right to the heart of the matter. And he says this, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. We've already noted that today. Verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry uh-oh, with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults uh-oh, his brother will be liable to, to the council. And whoever says you fool, this word is moros in the Greek, where we get the word moron, okay? We could say, it, it's literally empty-headed, brainless, we'd say. Idiot is what we might say. Now, don't get hung up on the words like, no, don't say fool. I've heard that before, like in the past. If you say fool, you die and go to hell. Uh, no, probably not. Um, but, but, okay, what about, okay, so it means idiot? Jeff, what else does it mean? I don't want to say anything like that. No, 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 you're going to see. It's more of an attitude of the heart. It's in the mind. But it also is, yes, when you deface devalue when you when you break down rip apart another person it says you will be liable to to the hell of fire now here's what jesus is doing he's going from murder to say listen if this happens in your heart you're going to be held accountable in the same way that a murder would be this is verse 21 he's putting the context of murder now he's saying if you have this in your heart you're a murderer he's making no distinction verse 23 so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. Watch this. Worship. No, how about this? Reconciliation becomes a, 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 tr- a key aspect of worship. Loving others, being right with others, honoring humans, l- valuing human life as one who lives and is in the image of God, created in the image of God, comes into our worship. So worship becomes reconciliation. First be reconciled to your brother and then go, oh, then come and offer your gift. He's saying, man, your life is tied to worship. We sing songs and they, didn't, they, they shouldn't be, you know, in, in opposition uh, to what we do on a daily basis. Verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, You will never get out until you have paid the last penny. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, he's saying, listen, there's there's another kind of murder. And and, and this one, again, it has a twist. I mean, look at this. Look how this breaks down. I hope you'll see what I saw this week. Man, this is so convicting for me. So, so, So the second murder is this. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. You and me, okay, with our words in our hearts. All right, so so we are the suspect. And, and then our words become kind of this weapon, and it happens in our hearts. Look at this. Surprising place is in our hearts. Jesus says that, that if you get angry with a brother, uh, you'll, you'll face judgment. And the implication here, again, is the judgment that you will face is as if you have committed murder. This is what he's saying. You're like, man, that's a, that's a stretch, is it not? Or, or is it always wrong to be angry? And this is really traditionally is understood as anger without, without real cause. Okay, so getting mad over nothing at all or a personal affront. Uh, It's not righteous indignation, if you will. But remember, murder is an attempt to destroy the image of God in another person. 
So have you ever thought to yourself, man, if this person would just go away, I wish they were dead. I just don't want to see that person. I don't want them in my life anymore. I don't, want to, I don't want to encounter them. Could be somebody in your family. Could be, you know, relatives. Could be a friend or somebody at work. I just, I'm not going to deal with them anymore. I wish they didn't exist. This is what Jesus is talking about. Or if we, if we with, look at this, the, the surprising weapon is this. My words. My words become the weapon of choice. See, we pull out the weapon of choice and it's our tongues. The Greek word, again, is, is moros. It's to say that you're, you're just, you're an idiot. And, and, and I'm going to say this. It's kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to offer this. This week, I'm in the car. You know, it was like just a couple days ago. I'm driving. And Stacy's in the car. And uh, I'm driving along and right over here north of this highway. And it's like, okay, do you not see people? Do you not see that the lane is, I mean, it's in, get over. Can you not drive? Okay, you know, in my mind, and I'm, I say this out loud. Now, I don't think I said idiot or, or fool or more, but that's not really the point. I'm thinking, I'm so, much, I'm so much better than you at driving. If you were like me, you wouldn't be, come on, get over. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm murdering them in my mind. I'm coming after them. If you were as smart as I am, and I know we do this. We could do it with our kids. We can do it at work. If all of these idiots at work would just get their act together, we'd have something here. And we do it at home. And today could be a life-changing day for families here or for your relationships. See, some of us, some, some parents model this with, with spouses. And what we do in our day, we make cutting remarks, even sarcasm, and we just toss out JK. You are ridiculous, JK. You're so whipping stupid, JK. I'm all good. I'm good, JK. Like that's, a, like that's an act of grace or something. <laughs> but instead, we have weapons which are the tongue. And once the shots are fired, we can't get them back. Can't get them back. And we all do this. And what happened this week, I'm realizing, man, I do this so much more than I've ever realized. And James chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, it's on the screen there. He says it this way. Uh, it, you know, you, we, you might remember this teaching. He, he says, you know, we can tame any kind of animal. We've learned how to tame all kinds of, of animals. But the tongue, nobody can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings. Here it is again. Look at this. Who have been made in God's likeness. Friends, listen, this week, every person you see is made in God's likeness. And many of us in the moment will look at someone and make a judgment about them based on what they're wearing, based on the color of their skin. We all do this. Let me see somebody and maybe they get in our way about something and get cut in line or again in a car. You know, my car is nicer than their car. Idiot. You're not nearly as educated as I am. We all do this. Jesus said, murder. You're defacing, you're criticizing, you're putting down. And some of us, look at where he goes. He says, out of the mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Out of our mouth should be praise and encouragement and love, as we're going to see. Well, Jeff, can I be critical at times? Can I point out sin and somebody else? Um, okay, too often in the home even, we don't parent by grace, we parent through criticism, and we crush our children. And listen, I'm, I'm going to talk to some of you parents here. If criticism and if biting, you know, cutting words have become normal in your home, you need to end that. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. Our children are raised in a home where everybody loves each other. And one of the things we talk about here, one of our staff values is to never triangulate. We, we cut, we murder, we kill others when we try and we talk about someone when they're not around we're snipers is what we are and so we have a staff value it says i i'll never talk about you until i've talked to you and then only for you and never against you and your home should be that way we have an idiom for that it's stabbing someone in the back it's a reference to murder 
Because when we do, we are, we're, we're, we're putting down, we're defacing, we're, we're, we're discrediting someone who's created in the image of God. You see how this works? And, 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 and we put others down. I've always taught my kids, if somebody's putting you down, it's because they're trying to raise themselves up. You see, it, it reveals our own fragility. And then we, and we do it as adults. We put others down who don't agree with us. And we live in a culture, man, where wit and sarcasm are valued over love and compassion. Can we talk about what happens online? I mean, we don't have time to go there, right? Social media and how people, you sit behind a screen and people blast others. Listen, nobody cares about your opinion. They care about your love. We're not going to win people over because we've argued them. I have never seen on Facebook or any social media platform, I've never seen anyone, hey, as a result of a wonderful conversation we had on Facebook, I have changed my opinion about that radically. Thank you so much. Would you share some more? <laughs> Nobody's ever done that. Not that I know of. And, and, and yet oftentimes it's, gosh, Sadly, it's the Christian, you know. And then the world, the watching world kind of looks into that. So we got, this, we got this, un, this, this surprising weapon. You see the surprising suspect. It's me. It's me. I mean, th think about this. Every now and then I read the Bible. <laughs> this should be every time I read the Bible. But every now and then I read the Bible and I go, oh my gosh, this is about me. Every parable, Jesus, if we, if we approach it right, we always end up being like the protagonist or the hero, not the one who's like, uh-oh. And here it's clear. Jesus is saying, every one of us, every one of us do this, and the surprising suspect is me. Look at the twist. No one suspects the regular church goer. Nobody expects the deacon or, or the worship leader or the choir member. Nobody expects the person who's... Nobody expects the pastor. But it's me... It's me. And this, when this hit me this week, I'm the murderer. I realize I'm not just a murderer. I'm like a serial killer. Because I have like, thoughts like that. I'm sorry if this like, man. And you, you've guessed, man, your, your pastor's whacked. No, no. I mean, I'm just like, I want to outgrace people. And I feel like I do, you know, most of the time. But I know that, man, I can have thoughts that, that run there, right? So he, he says, this is a matter of the heart. So it's real clear at times, you know, verbal ridicule, abuse, you know, equals murder, as does physical, emotional, sexual abuse, all murderous affronts to God. But we think that we're safe in our minds. And, and, and so, you know, every, every time we think about this command, I want you to consider that, man, I'm, I'm guilty. Now, here's the thing, and here's where I'm going to land. A lot of us, you might be thinking, if you're with me, and if you've allowed the Spirit to truly touch your heart today, you're like me this week. I'm going, man, I don't know if I can ever. I mean, I want to obey this command. This is like one of the ten, one of the top ten. I want to obey this. And maybe some of you feel like, I don't know that I could ever obey this command. This seems, this seems like I, there's no way. I have no hope. But there is good news. Because there's one more murder that I want us to look at. The third one is this one, the world with a cross in Jerusalem. Ironically, this, murders, this, this murder allows us to be set free from guilt and, and free from all the, the, the murderous forms that we bring into our lives in the way that we have not obeyed this command. In fact, here's what I want us to do. I'm going to read, and in fact, I just want you to listen to this. I'm going to read Mark 15, and I want you to hear the murderous story of Jesus on the cross, a longer passage than normal, admittedly, but I want you to just listen to this and consider the various ways that Jesus was murdered. He was killed in every way possible. Mark 15, verse 16, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. This is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head. Another gospel writer says they were hitting him, hitting him. 
boxing him, hitting him in the head, in the face. And here with a reed, and they were spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him. And they led him out to be crucified. And that's loaded with details. Just that, that statement. And then they got Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross because he couldn't anymore. He said it was the third hour when they crucified him. He's on the cross for six hours that Friday. And the inscription that charged against him over his head, it read the king of the Jews, just mocking him. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. They were, and the people, all the passers-by derided him, and they were wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes, the religious leaders, mocked him to one another, saying, he, he saved others. He can't even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross and so we can see and believe. And those who crucified him, or were crucified with him, they reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it. and said, man, he's calling Elijah. And others said, wait, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And Jesus cried out in a loud voice. We know he cried out, it is finished, to tell us die. Cry of victory, by the way. And he breathed his last. And there was one centurion there who watched him die. You can learn a lot about somebody when you watch him die. And he said, surely this man was the son of God. And so, friends, I want you to remember, according to Old Testament law, if you murder someone, and I hope that by God's spirit, you've seen what I've seen this week. I'm guilty. Man, I'm guilty. More than I know in my thoughts, in my mind, more than what I say even. I'm guilty. And the Bible says that the price for murdering another created in the image of God is that your life is required. Your life is given for the one that you murder. So you can today, you can either choose, well, I, I guess I need to die for what I've done. Or you can choose to believe that Christ himself has died for you. That he wasn't just your good example. That he was your substitute. And the Old Testament law tells you, you can't pay it off. You can't work it off. Christ alone has come to set us free. You can stop stashing away all the evidence, the guilt, the shame, the frustration, the hatred in every corner of your life. You can turn to Christ and allow Him to forgive you and decide you're going to live differently. Because listen, to all of the believers here, all Christians here, we don't just need to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'll try to you know, clean up my language. I'm going to not be so critical. I'm going to not say these words that are crushing my children or people around me. I'm going to try hard to think about loving others as Christ has loved me. Listen, when you come to Christ, His Spirit starts to transform your heart. So that in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, it says that there's coming a day, and it is now, friends, when our weapons of, of, of destruction... Where we wage war with our tongues, our, I mean, we're tearing people down and ripping people apart. Swords and spears are going to be turned into plowshares and pruning hooks. He's going to take our creative energies and all that we want to bring to put people down. Yes, to bring ourselves up. And instead, we're going to use our words to encourage and bless. And instead of cursing people with our tongue, we're going to praise God by the way that we speak. And every word that comes out of our mouths are going to be words of encouragement and words of love. Because that's who we are. Even in our worship of life, we reconcile with others. And we love, 
we outgrace, we encourage each other. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to close our time in a powerful way. We're going to sing a song together. And I don't want anybody running out, but I want us to do what we're going to do here as we close. To remember. Just remember what Christ has done for us. Because every time this week, when you think, oh, but Christ went to the cross for me. I want you to remember Mark 15. Or I'm going to, oh my, you are driving me. Christ has already taken this upon himself. I'm free now to encourage, to love and bless, not to cut down and to rip apart. Let's be a people who encourage and love each other with our words. So I want to pray over us. And then the team's going to lead us uh, in a song as we close out our time together. All right. And, and, and so let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Uh, we're, we're going to have opportunity to use our tongues to, to hurt, to deface, to rip people apart. In our minds, we can tear people down. They were only as smart as we were, only as Christian as I was, only as right as me. Friends, listen, if your desire to be right is greater than your desire to love, then something's wrong in your heart. So we get to worship God with our tongues today as we close. We get to proclaim the truth of what he's done for us. So let's just spend a moment and remember. And as we go. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.